Good afternoon and welcome everyone to another session of Biodiversity Cell. I hope everyone is safe and healthy. Today, our session is on Hornbill Conservation in India by Karishma Pradhan. It is said that when they fly through the forest, they sound like a small airplane. It is said that our work speaks for our itself and our esteemed guest Karishma Pradhan is one of the perfect example of it. She completed her schooling in our hometown, Kalimpong, and went to do her botany honors from Delhi University. After working for a few years, she completed her MSc Wildlife Conservation Action from the Institute of Environment, Education and Research, Bharatiya Bidyapet University, Pune. Over the years, she has worked in various conservation organizations like Wildlife Conservation Nepal, WWF India, A3, and is currently associated with Nature Conservation Foundation, NCF. Her previous work has focused on imparting qualities, environmental education, and awareness through various formal and non-formal approaches. There are various target groups involved like school students, teachers, corporate groups, and community members living in the fringe of biodiverse habitats. Currently at NCF, she coordinates a hornbill research and conservation project in West Bengal and a community-based conservation initiative in Arunachal Pradesh, the Hornbill Adoption Program. Apart from wildlife, she is also passionate about reading, singing, and just being outdoors. She believes that building a cadre of responsible citizens who take out time to appreciate nature is extremely crucial at this point as we face challenges from the climate crisis and major decline in biodiversity. Before handing over to Ma'am, I'd like to inform everyone that there will be a QA and a session at the end of the session. So if you have any question, you can ask at that time, you can turn on your video and ask the question. And if you have any question in between, then you can write in the chat box, we'll take at the QA and session. Also, I'd like to request that at the end of the session, we'll be sharing the feedback form. And I request everyone, please kindly fill the form. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tahir. Uh, thank you also, uh, Shilpa and the Biodiversity Cell for this invitation. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, good evening, everybody. I am Karishma, and I'm very delighted to be here. Also, thank you for joining in on a Sunday evening. Seems that you've been doing this for quite some time, so we actually understand the kind of passion and interest you already have in this subject. Um, I work with the Eastern Himalaya. Oh, just let me share the screen. Give me a second. Okay, just a minute. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yes, okay. yes we can see. Sure. So I'm Karishma. I am uh, work with the Eastern Himalaya Program of Nature Conservation Foundation. NCF is a, a wildlife research and conservation organization that works across India. And uh, right from the Trans Himalayas in high altitudes to the oceans and coast, tropical forests of Western Ghats and uh, Eastern Himalayas and also grasslands. NCF also focuses a lot on uh, different other uh, species and uh, important habitats. Uh, the Eastern Himalaya program of NCF, uh, where, which I am associated with, has been leading wildlife research and community-led conservation in India's Northeast for over 20 years. Uh, today, I will be taking you through some of our hornbill-focused research and conservation initiatives in the Eastern Himalayas. Particularly, uh, I'll be talking about two sites, uh, the North Bengal landscape and Arunachal Pradesh. This work is overlooked and guided by Dr. Aprajita Datta, who has been studying hornbills for over 25 years, and uh, also Dr. Rohit Naniwadikar, who is also a senior scientist in NCF. So yeah, um, I remember Shilpa saying that may, many of you may uh, have seen hornbills, may not have seen hornbills. So quickly, if you can unmute yourself and tell me how many of you have not seen hornbills. Anybody here who has not seen any hornbills? So everyone's seen. I guess. People, you can yeah. talk. Yeah, you can unmute yourself. Let me know if you've not seen even one hornbill uh, till now. I've not seen any hornbill. You've not seen, okay. 
yeah so uh, then it gives me even more uh, more privilege to share with you that we have nine species of hornbills in india uh, india is as you would know a very very uh, biodiverse biodiverse rich country and uh, even in hornbills we have nine different species six of these species are found in the eastern himalayas uh, this indian grey hornbill is found in some pockets of uh, west bengal uh reed hornbill is found in uh, many parts of the northeast oriental pied hornbill is uh, quite abundantly seen the rufous necked hornbill is a slightly higher elevation uh, species this is also found here the widely distributed great hornbill is also found here and uh, the brown hornbill also is found in uh, the eastern himalayas closer to you in pune uh, in the western ghats you would uh, see the I think in Pune, a lot of you would have seen the Indian grey hornbill, right? Right. Yeah. 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 But uh, there's also uh, in the Western Ghats, you also see the Malabar grey hornbill, the Malabar pied hornbill, uh, the great hornbill. So yeah, that's the kind of diversity of uh, hornbills we have in India. And uh, as you can see, they are like extremely majestic and uh, beautiful birds, also known as giants of the uh, forest birds. The huge in size. and this particular uh, structure that you see above the beak is called a cask it's hollow and uh, it's believed that it helps in amplifying their call uh, in the forest they uh, they have very very distinctive calls very loud uh, like you know in the forest you would sometimes wonder like oh my god what is that if you're not familiar with the hornbill sound you would actually get scared for a minute they have uh, they also have uh, eyelashes unlike many other birds and uh, for the larger sized hornbills like the great hornbill and the reed hornbill you actually can also hear them before you see them like you know you hear the uh, wing beats from quite a distance like uh, tahir also mentioned in the introduction just to take you through uh, some of these uh, the four hornbill species that i uh, will be focusing on and is also uh, the focus species of our work in north bengal and arunachal pradesh this is the great hornbill uh, as you can see the, i've marked the male and the female the male has a red iris and the female has this uh, white iris and that's how we distinguish between the two this is uh, the oriental pied hornbill they are uh, they are slightly smaller in size compared to the great hornbill and uh, the female has black markings over its beak and in the cask whereas the male usually just has like you know small bit of mark here this is the reed hornbill uh, also one of my favorite hornbills as you can see the male and the female are quite easily uh, distinguishable the female has a blue pouch throat pouch whereas the male has these uh, this uh, very yellow colored throat pouch and uh, also the rufous necked hornbill uh this is uh, a hornbill species that is believed to be extinct from uh, nepal now and it's also vulnerable in the iucn red list uh, and uh, this get the name from the rufous color of the males the head the neck and the throat uh, has the breast has a rufous brown color whereas for the female they're mostly black and both the male and the female have these red throat pouches this here is a young chick so just to give you an idea of how loud uh, these hornbills are i'd like to play a video please let me know if you're not able to hear the audio i'm just going to be playing it uh, what did i do sorry ma'am we could hear the video we could see the video and hear the sorry. Yeah, so were you able to hear the sound clearly? Yes, we can. Yeah, so that was uh, a duet call of the great hornbill. They usually do this call during the breeding season, and it's it's very very loud. when you're walking in the forest it's a delight to hear them uh, call hornbills are also known as uh, farmers of the forest and rightly so because they have a very important ecological and functional role 
as seed dispersers in the forest ecosystem. Uh, it's believed that for the Asian forest hornbills, 90 to 95% of their diet consists of fruits. And I, uh, if you can see, like, you know, they have a very large gape size, which helps them to swallow large seeded fruits, uh, which many other birds cannot do because of their uh, smaller gape, uh, like the beak size. And uh, because they're also a large mobile species with a huge home range, they are able to disperse or like, you know, take the seeds like very far away from the parent tree. And that is important for germination because um, when a lot of these uh, seeds, they fall just below the parent tree, it, uh, they have a lot of competition between them and it uh, reduces their uh, germination success. So these hornbills help in transporting these seeds to different parts of the forest away from the parent tree where the, uh, where the germination success is more like, you know, is, is better. And uh, hornbills are also very clever in the sense that, you know, when they swallow the fruit, they just take the fleshy part of it and they swallow it. And the seed is uh, regurgitated or thrown out of its beak. And usually the seeds are unharmed. So we like, you know, uh, the seeds are able to germinate on the forest floor. These are some of the uh, hornbill food plants that are recorded uh, by studies in Arunachal Pradesh. And um, yeah, if there was a bar to be uh, made for the hornbills, they definitely should also include figs in the menu because hornbills also love figs. And because the fig seeds are very small, the uh, seeds are usually not regurgitated, uh, but usually it's passed on through their droppings. And that is also uh, like, you know, they, they are also able to germinate. This is another uh, site that is a uh, site to behold in the forest. If you're able to ever visit uh, Arunachal Pradesh, Pake, like, you know, uh, we have these huge congregations of hornbills that come close to the village areas and uh, they roost together in the evenings. You get to see a lot of interactions between the hornbills, like the males feeding the females, uh, hornbills moving from one branch to another, and just so much of social interactions that happens uh, in the evenings at these roost sites. These roost sites are often located uh, near streams and uh, rivers and often in like, you know, an open habitat. What's also extremely fascinating about hornbills is the way uh, they breed. Anybody, uh, you, I think a lot of you must be familiar with the hornbill breeding biology, right? Has anybody been able to observe this in the wild? No, absolutely not. We knew that uh, they make in the cavity the nest and uh, but we are never that fortunate to get to see uh, so not even for the uh, gray hornbill uh, some, no, no not oh. even for gray hornbill that's really weird means I at least about i it. haven't i haven't seen or okay. witnessed okay. i have read about it but never seen it okay okay yeah so yeah, I'd be even more happy to share with you uh, some of the observations that we've had uh, from the wild. And I really hope that at some point, like, you know, you have a hornbill pair coming to symbiosis and uh, nesting in one of the trees later. So yeah, um, so hornbills are secondary nest cavity nesters, which means that they cannot form uh, cavities on their own. You know, unlike many other birds like woodpeckers and barbets, uh, they are not uh, able to make these uh, uh, cavities. So they're dependent on already existing cavities in large trees because they're large size in uh, like, you know, their bodies are of large size. They require large uh, cavities and like, you know, these really big trees and Tetramelis nudiflora is supposed to be uh, one of the tree species that uh, they like, you know, nest in about 90 to 95% of nest trees are found in this particular uh, tree species. It's called the Tetramelis nudiflora. It's a deciduous uh, tree. They also exhibit site fidelity, which basically means that, you know, hornbills can come and nest in the same nest cavity that they've used in the previous year, and they can regularly use the same cavity in different years, provided that the, um, the cavities are still suitable for nesting. So the female is extremely finicky about like, you know, uh, choosing her uh, nest. So in the, at, at the onset of the breeding season, uh, which is January to mid-Feb in the Eastern Himalayas, the hornbill pair, they like, you know, they go and visit the nest tree. You also get to see like new young, uh, like uh, breeding 
hornbill pairs, which are probably going to be like, you know, breeding for the first time. They will be looking for new hornbill uh, cavities. And these, they come and they visit these nest trees and, you know, they inspect the cavity. Also, uh, they take a lot of time to clean the cavity because there's a lot of muck that has remained there from uh, like, you know, the last breeding season. The female then like, you know, uh, check, keeps continuing cleaning the uh, cavity. She keeps inspecting the cavity. The male in the meantime, like, you know, tries to feed her and tries to coax her to uh, get into the cavity. And uh, yeah, I mean, the female, once she enters the cavity, does this very interesting thing where she seals the cavity from the inside using her own droppings and sometimes also mud. And she plasters the whole thing, leaving just a tiny slit open in the middle. You know, I think you can see this there right, in the picture. So these, uh, this tiny slit is open, uh, left open for the male to come and uh, deliver food to her and later to the chick as well. Uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting, like, you know, how they would have thought of all of this and how, how, how it even came into being. But yeah, so it keeps away the predators, uh, but at the same time, there's enough space for food to be delivered. Once the female enters, she lays her eggs, she incubates the eggs and then the chicks, they hatch. The, throughout this entire season, I mean, the breeding season, the female remains inside and uh, the breeding duration differs uh, based on different species. The larger bodied hornbills like the great hornbill, the great hornbill take about 120 days, 120 to 130 days, about four months. And during this entire period, the female remains there. The male also has a very difficult task in bringing food for the female and later the chick every day, like, you know, several times in a day. So yeah, the male also has to go looking for food, foraging for food in the uh, forest and bringing back different uh, food items. Uh, from our uh, studies, we've also seen that, you know, different hornbill species seem to prefer like, you know, different shaped cavities. And uh, the great hornbill seems to be mostly nesting in these elongated uh, shaped cavities great hornbill slightly oval shaped cavities and oriental pied hornbill uh, like you know seem to prefer these round smaller smaller uh, holes and uh, more round in shape but uh, we've also been observing a lot of competition between hornbill species and sometimes a hornbill uh, a nest which was used by a great hornbill can be taken over by a wreath hornbill in the following year this could also be because uh, they may not have, they may like, you know, the habitat may be declining in the forest and uh, they may not be finding the correct suitable cavity for them to nest in. So there's, this is an indication of like, you know, um, habitat loss as well. This are uh, just sharing some examples of competition for nest. Uh, we have many from our studies, but uh, just share these two. If you see here that you see a male great hornbill outside a cavity, right? And you would assume that there would be a female great hornbill inside, but that was not the case. Uh, there was a breeding rufous necked hornbill uh, female inside this cavity. And this particular breeding, uh, I mean, this particular great hornbill pair, uh, the male was here, the female was somewhere in the nest also, would keep coming and disturbing this female who's sealed inside. And, you know, the male would go on to offer her uh, food, from the beak, the rufous necked hornbill female would refuse and would be calling aggressively from the inside. And the great hornbill pair would just keep, like, you know, they just kept disturbing this, uh, uh, this hornbill inside. And also maybe because they're uh, larger sized uh, and like, you know, the rufous neck male would try to avoid coming to the nest tree every time the great hornbill pair was present. So there was a lot of disturbance which left, uh, like, you know, we, this particular female had to abandon this nest midway and this nest was not successful because of uh, this disturbance by the great hornbill pair. Also uh, in this tree that you see, this was used for 12 years by a reed hornbill pair. And this year we uh, saw that a great hornbill pair has taken over and uh, had successful nest nesting in this season. And uh, yeah, I mean, hornbills are not the only ones that uh, nest in cavities. So they also have to compete with a lot of other animals, uh, which are also cavity nesters. Like for example, two of our brown hornbill nests in upper, upper Assam were occupied by monitor lizards this year. 
Uh, one of our very old reed hornbill nest tree was taken over by this uh, Asian bard outlet. Uh, I think I'll have to, can I, I'm sorry, I just have to charge my laptop. Just give me a second. So, yes, yes, go ahead. Till ma'am comes, if anyone has any question, you can put in the chat box. I request everyone, if anyone of you have any question, put in the chat box too. Yeah, okay. sorry, I had forgotten to switch on the... It's okay. Charger. Yeah, can I go ahead? Yes, ma'am. Sure. So yeah, uh, this very, uh, like, you know, this nest tree which was used by the Thornbill was taken by this Asian bar outlet, which let uh, our like one of the nest protectors who's been monitoring this nest tree for many years was actually very angry about this, but I mean, it's just the way of nature and we let the uh, outlet be. In another instance last year, this oriental hobby uh, tried to occupy this great hornbill nest, but uh, towards, yeah, I think about uh, one or two weeks of competition and the reed hornbill was able to uh, take over this nest. So I'll uh, now come towards uh, North Bengal and share some of the research and conservation work that we've been doing in this landscape. Uh, started in no November 2017 in collaboration with Nature Mates Nature Club, which is a Kolkata based uh, conservation organization. This is the first study of hornbills in the North Bengal landscape and it's particularly important because it forms the westernmost distributional limit of the uh, global range for the reed hornbill and the rufous necked hornbill. This also allows us to, you know, understand uh, the distribution, the abundance and uh, different, like, you know, the breeding biology of these species in uh, this landscape. And because we have long-term data and uh, our observations from uh, Arunachal Pradesh, it also allows us for comparison between these sites. Uh, we not just focus on the hornbill species, but it's also important that we study the habitat as well. So, a lot of our surveys are also directed towards understanding the vegetation composition and forest structure. And after getting a lot of these baseline information, then we then try to like, you know, establish relationships between hornbills and the habitats. We try to see the correlation between these uh, different variables. And all of this also helps us in identifying uh, threats to hornbills, the habitat, and uh, what is the future uh, scope of conservation initiatives that can be um, established in partnership with different key stakeholders. So this is how we uh, first, like, you know, try to establish a baseline information when we enter a new landscape. Baksa Tiger Reserve is in Alipur Dwar district and it spans uh, 760 square kilometers. This is one of the sites that we've been focusing on in North Bengal. Uh, even though we've done some preliminary surveys in two other national park, I mean, protected areas, Mahananda National Park and the Neura Valley National Park. Uh, Baksa Tiger Reserve uh, also is part of the Himalaya biodiversity hotspot. And uh, it, we, so we started off with uh, studying of breeding, the, the studying the breeding biology of hornbills in this landscape. Even though we've, uh, we've ha we have quite a substantial uh, amount of literature and information on uh, the breeding biology from other sites in Western Ghats and in Arunachal Pradesh. But uh, because this was a new site, it was important that we understood if there were similarities or differences in the breeding uh, biology. So uh, these are some, some of the locations of where the hornbill nests are located. Uh, the blue ones here are nests of oriental pied hornbills, the yellow ones of the great hornbills, and they are uh, lowland preferring species and most of the nests are in the lower areas of Baksa. Whereas the rufous necked hornbill uh, depicted by red dots here and uh, these wheat hornbills are uh, mostly like seem to be uh, nesting in the higher elevation areas of Baksa. So uh, to like, you know, uh, have a, get a 
clear and a proper picture of the breeding biology. What we do is we uh, adapt these uh, methods that have been used in other studies. And these are very intensive methods that we use uh, where we try to get eight to 10 hours of weekly observation. And we uh, selected two great hornbill nests and two rufous necked hornbill nests for this. So at each nest, we have about eight to 10 hours of weekly observation. Over the last, over two years in 2018 and 19, we had about 480 hours of observation for the great hornbill and 328 hours of observations for the rufous necked hornbill. And uh, during these observations, what we do is we try to uh, record the number of times the male visits the nest tree for feeding or like, you know, sometimes it may not be for feeding, but it just comes and visits the nest tree. It also, uh, also every time it delivers food to the female, we try and identify the food item because the hornbill, like, you know, before feeding it uh, regurgitates and it uh, keeps the food item at it in its beak before it passes it on to the female. So that's when we are able to get a quick glimpse of what the food item is. We try and record it. We try and identify the food species. Uh, if you're not able to do it with binoculars, we also sometimes take videos. We come back to our base camp and uh, go through the videos and you know are able to then see uh, what item was delivered. We also count the number of individual items that were fed to the female. <clears throat> I'll not get into the details of this, but I just wanted to share some you know, very interesting uh, stuff that we get from these observations that we made. This is for the great hornbill. Uh, it's uh, known that the great hornbill chick usually hatches around the seventh and eighth week after the female enters the uh, cavity. And so you can uh, like um, divide the entire breeding cycle into the pre-hatching phase and the post-hatching phase. And what's interesting is like, you know, from our observations also, we saw that after the sixth week, towards the seventh week onwards, you start seeing a increase in the visitation rate and the food delivery rate. So visitation is rate, rate is nothing but the number of visits the male uh, is making to the nest tree per hour. And uh, the food delivery rate is the number of food items being delivered per hour. So you see that you know after the chick is hatched, you are able to notice that there is an increase in the number of times the male is visiting because then like, you know, the male also has to bring food, not just for the female, but for the chick as well. Another very interesting, I, I don't want to get into uh, too much of the uh, research part, but I thought I would sh share this with you is uh, like, you know, there's such intelligent species where uh, if you see in the initial year, like this is the composition of the diet of the great hornbill uh, during the breeding season. And like I told you, every time the male was delivering food, we were recording the species and we were counting the number of individuals that were being fed. So like, you know, figs, which is represented by orange here, seems to be uh, quite a like, you know, preferred diet throughout the breeding season. But particularly in the first few weeks, it's uh, there is like, you know, uh, like a larger amount of figs being fed. And uh, figs are also known to be rich in calcium. So we think that you obviously it's like, you know, would help in uh, the egg uh, the he the health of the eggs and also in like bone formation of the uh, chick and then from the seventh week six week seventh week onwards you start seeing an increase in the animal items that are being delivered and that is again obviously to supplement the uh, protein requirement of the chick of the newly hatched chick so I mean, they're extremely important. It's a very intelligent species. And uh, these are some of the observations that we were able to record from these nest watches. Uh, yeah, so in uh, Baksa during the breeding season, we saw that uh, the percentage of fruits in the diet was uh, still very high. And the insect item, I mean, the animal items consisted of insects, crabs, lizards, eggs, and uh, also bird chicks very briefly to take you through the breeding uh, cycle. The hornbill nest, I mean, the hornbill pair start visiting the nest tree. Uh, you get to see a lot of courtship display. Uh, the female and the male, they inspect the cavity, they clean the cavity. Finally, the female enters the cavity. She uh, seals it from the inside and just leaves a tiny slit open for the male to be able to deliver food. All through the breeding season, the male brings different kinds of food for the female and the chick. In the case of the great hornbill, the female emerges out after three months. 
and uh, the chick is seen resealing the cavity and uh, finally after another one month the chick finally comes out as well whereas for other species like the reed hornbill oriental pied hornbill rufous neck hornbill it was observed that the mother and the chick usually they come out on the same day or just a few days apart i'll uh, just show you this video of the breeding cy uh, cycle of the great hornbill with the observations that we've had from buxa let me just play it for you Hello? Oh. Are you able to hear the sound? Yes, yes. ma'am, we can hear. This is beautiful. <laughs> So this is great on bill chick yes great on bill wow yeah so did you like the video these are all observations uh, from baksa so they uh, usually poop uh, outside uh, yes, angling their anus exactly at the slit yes 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 wow <laughs> they they i know they are such fascinating uh, birds they because they i wanted to birds. ask the same thing how they I means uh, if there are more chicks and the female then uh, how they must be uh, keeping the hygiene and everything yeah yeah so even uh, even apart from the defecation even like you know during the day you keep seeing the female like you know remove like small small items from the nest and like you know she keeps throwing it outside from that small slit so she keeps it clean throughout like you know during the day also like how we usually clean our house every day mm -hmm. so that's what she does also she keeps throwing little twigs that probably enters like you know uh, the nest and yeah i mean they they very they seem to be very uh, finicky and very particular about their hygiene <laughs> it also teaches us like you know apart from uh, the ecological uh, like you know a lot of ecological information that we gather we also there like, so many other values that you learn when you do these observations and i used to sit uh, in front of the nest tree for about 8 to 10 hours in a day and you know there is like you you try and see like the kind of trust that the uh, male and the female have upon each other right like the female enters the cavity and you know she's there she's sealed herself inside but she trusts that her partner will come and deliver food for 3 months 4 months at a length and also once the female comes out then you know they share responsibilities and you know in looking after the chick in guarding the nest or bringing food 
so yeah it's it's in, it's quite incredible the learnings that you have from the wild <laughs> Yeah, so moving on to the other uh, aspect of our work, which is also very important, was uh, trying to estimate uh, hornbill populations in Paksa Tiger Reserve because it was a new uh, landscape and there's, there'd been no hornbill uh, studies before. It was important for us to get an idea of the distribution, the density, the abundance of hornbills here. Uh, these are mostly done in the non breeding season to avoid any uh, kind of, uh, you know, um, what do you call, uh, biasness in the data. Uh, 1.5 kilometer of transects are walked. Uh, Baksa Tiger Reserve is divided into 25 square kilometer grids. And, you know, in each grid, we try to cover three trails of 1.5 kilometer, and it's done in the early mornings. So uh, the parameters that are recorded during these transects are the hornbill species. We try and uh, we count the number of individuals that we cite, uh, the time of sighting, also the activity, whether they're foraging, if they're foraging, what, uh, which food, hornbill food plant are they feeding on, uh, whether they are on flight, whether it was just a call. We also have to observe the perpendicular distance from the observer to the animal. Uh, we take the GPS coordinates and uh, we also record hornbill food plants with ripe fruits on uh, 10, 10 meter uh, on either side of the trail. So yeah, all of these are used as uh, different ecological variables while we're trying to uh, like, you know, do a further analysis. Uh, this is the entire area of Baksa and our team has done this incredible effort of uh, walking almost uh, all the parts of Baksa to try and get uh, an estimation of hornbill populations. As you can see, only these two fragments were left out, but otherwise we've covered quite a huge uh, ground. And these are uh, like, you know, the trails that were, that were walked on. We try and keep a distance of at least 500 meters apart from uh, between the two trails. Uh, so again, I'm not going to go into the details of the study findings, but uh, uh, just to give you a general picture, we from two hornbill uh, breeding seasons, that was the non-breeding seasons, that was in 2019 and 20 and 2020 and 21. From September to March, the team was there walking transects and trying to get uh, good, like, you know, baseline information on hornbill distribution and abundance. We saw that uh, the oriental pied hornbill seems to be the most abundant species in Baksa. Horn, uh, oriental pied hornbill uh, are also known to be adaptable species and uh, they also prefer secondary forests. Rufus necked hornbill detections were pretty low, which was also kind of expected because they are a uh, higher elevation preferring species. Reed hornbill uh, were also slightly low, but like you know, like I had said in the beginning, they, this Baksa Tiger Reserve uh, forms the westernmost distributional limit of its uh, global distribution range. And it's expected that at the edges of their range, like you know, the numbers would, the densities would uh, like, you know, could be lower as compared to the interiors. And yeah, even the great hornbill uh, detections were not very great. But uh, yeah, from these detections, then we then try and estimate the densities and the abundance for the entire Baksa Tiger Reserve. These are just number of uh, like, you know, sightings that we had. And from here, we then extrapolate, uh, extrapolate the information and get uh, the densities. We also uh, monitor hornbill roost sites in Baksa uh, if, uh, in the non breeding season. So towards the evening, we go to these few uh, identified roost sites and we count the number of individuals that arrive at these sites. And uh, yeah, we had this uh, incredible uh, sighting of over 200 hornbills uh, in this particular evening at this roost site in Baksa. Share a video of this. So these are all hornbills. Yeah. And mixed species? No, no, this is just the reed hornbill. Okay. We've been monitoring this particular roost site for over, uh, I think, four, uh, four non weeding seasons now. But this was the largest count that we had this evening. Yeah. So, uh, in the last four years, uh, like I told you, this was a very new landscape for us, but 
uh, through a lot of uh, effort that the team has put in, a uh, special mention to my colleagues, Sitaram and Kijang, who belong to the local communities in Baksa, and my other colleague, Dolo, who is from Kolkata. So through a tremendous effort of uh, covering the entire Baksa Tiger Reserve, we have good um, estimation of their densities, their abundance, and also the vegetation structure. So we were able to uh, understand what are the hornbill habitat relationships. And also we've uh, also found like, you know, there are a lot of uh, certain threats to the species and the habitat, which gives us further scope to increase our uh, conservation efforts by involving other partners as well. So now that we've got a good ecological uh, baseline information on hornbill species, we now further plan to expand our uh, efforts in trying to engage with communities. So Baksa Tiger Reserve has a lot of these uh, settlements even within the Tiger Reserve and in the periphery as well. So we've identified certain villages and from early next year, <coughs> we would be going and um, trying to engage with uh, people through group discussions, through interviews, through questionnaires and to understand the history of the landscape, to understand the socioeconomic status and any cultural association with hornbills. We also hope to understand the attitudes and perception of people towards hornbills and wildlife by doing the social science surveys. And uh, all of these information, the ecological information, as well as the social aspect of uh, the work that we would be doing early next year, will then help us and guide us to, you know, try and develop and design better conservation efforts. So we would have a good um, basis on how to design these outreach activities for school children, teachers, nature guides, and like, you know, the frontline staff. We've also been working with a few other communities in the North Bengal landscape. There's this site called Lat Panchar. Uh, if any of you are uh, birders and you follow these Facebook uh, like pages on like, you know, bird, uh, where, where, they, where different photographers share bird photographs and all, you would see that there's a whole lot of images being shared on the Rufus Neck Hornbill from this particular place called Lat Panchar, which is in the fringes of Mahananda Wildlife Sanctuary, which is also uh, in North Bengal. So we're trying to engage and uh, work with the nature guides there and trying to help them like, you know, follow some uh, like proper ethical wildlife tourism practices. We've given them guidelines. We've uh, interacted with them a couple of times. And we are also encouraging them to form a proper, like, you know, recognized guides association. And uh, so hornbills and like, you know, uh, just it's, it's become a more, it's become a very popular site amongst bird enthusiasts and photographers for hornbills. But at the same time, like, you know, we would not want uh, these kind of like, you know, the mass tourism that uh, usually takes place to disturb the birds for the long-term sustenance of the communities themselves. Uh, last year, we also helped uh, publish this article in Round Glass Sustain, where with the observations that the local community members in Latpanchar had over the years, we've uh, put it together in a very interesting article where, you know, without uh, much guidance, they've uh, observed the breeding biology of the rufous night hornbill, the kind of diet that it has across the years, and a lot of interesting observations on hornbills and other biodiversity. So uh, using their observations, we've uh, given the entire authorship of the article also to them. We just help in facilitating these uh, articles. So this was something that came out last year. And also based on our study findings, we feel it's important that we you know we share our study findings with the local communities and the forest department. So we also create these posters and uh, share it with the local communities so that they know that, you know, they, they know the kind of information that we're uh, doing is like, you know, uh, important to understand the ecological aspect of these species. And yeah, so we've also made this booklet based on our study findings in North Bengal. Now I'll quickly take you to uh, Pake Tiger Reserve where NCF has been working for over two decades. And uh, I will particularly, there's a lot of research, good research work that has happened in this landscape, but I will mostly focus on this community-led conservation initiative called the Hornbill Nest Adoption Program. So uh, this is uh, the Pake Tiger Reserve in Arunachal Pradesh, and just outside it is the Papam Reserve Forest. Because it's, uh, it's not a protected area, the Papam Reserve Forest receives lesser degree of protection and uh, faces un 
unprecedented anthropogenic pressures, but it also covers a larger area than compared to the Tiger Reserve. And you know, hornbills being large mobile species, they have a huge home range and they use both the reserve uh, forest as well as the tiger reserve for the everyday foraging and you know, going from here to there. So that gave us an opportunity to increase the scope of conservation beyond the tiger reserve. And uh, in the reserve forest, it was especially seen, uh, I mean, it was especially uh, important to in involve the local communities in the conservation efforts. Also, <clears throat> the local tribal community, uh, the Nishis, <clears throat> they have a very, uh, like they, they, they're culturally very linked to the Great Hornbill because they use the great, uh, the beak of the Great Hornbill in this traditional headgear of theirs. Earlier, they used to hunt the bird species themselves, but over time, there were a lot of conservation organizations and the forest department that helped and persuaded them to you know, shift to these fiber uh, beaks. So now they've all most of most of the uh, Nishi community members have shifted to these fiber uh, beaks, which looks very real, but at the same time does not require them to hunt the bird. So yeah, the Hornbill Nest Adoption Program is a community-led conservation initiative uh, in the Papam Reserve Forest outside the Pake Tiger Reserve, and it's uh, based on the concept of shared parenting, where the hornbills have three sets of parents. First is obviously the biological parents, the hornbills themselves. Then you have these local Nishi uh, members who are taken in, in, uh, taken in as the nest protectors and they are the local guardians of hornbills. And we have a lot of the uh, other individuals and institutions who support the program financially and through other ways. The program officially launched in 2012 as a three-way partnership between the forest department, the Ghoda Abe Society, which is a council of village headmen, and Nature Conservation Foundation. It's based on uh, uh, partnership on, uh, and it's based on partnerships where like, you know, the responsibilities and roles of each partner is designated in advance and all of them agree to it. And in 2017, we had the Pake Baga Hornbill Festival Committee that also joined in as the fourth partner. Currently, the program has 11 nest protectors, all belonging to the local Nishi uh, community. As you can see, there are some uh, elderly, uh, elderly men and some young, young folks. So all of them are like, you know, they come together with this joint passion and dedication to protect and uh, save hornbills. Uh, over the last 10 years, we've had about 21 nest protectors who've been associated with the program. What do the nest protectors do? Well, they don't just protect hornbill nests, but they're also now uh, trained enough to like, you know, uh, conduct uh, hornbill roost monitoring where they count a number of individuals. They also conduct transects in the non-breeding season to count hornbills and other wildlife. And uh, uh, to be a nest protector, they agree that, you know, they will um, support hornbill conservation in the landscape and will also not be involved in any illegal, uh, like, you know, logging or hunting activities. Being a nest protector has not just given them a source of livelihood, but is also a very, uh, uh, like, you know, has given them an identity. Over the years, the team of nest protectors have received various trainings that help them in uh, recording their observations. And also uh, they share the observations with us on an on, through an online portal. Uh, they're also well-trained in uh, nature education modules where uh, we conduct nature camps for school students every year and the nest protectors help us in these camps as well. They've, uh, the Hornbill Nest Adoption Program has received several uh, national and regional recognition, including the Sanctuary Asia Award in 2014 and the India Biodiversity Award in 2016. The nest protectors are looked upon as conservation leaders and role models in the villages and help us in like, you know, uh, sensitizing the local communities on various conservation measures. This is a our typical uh, Monday morning meeting that we have in this uh, traditional Nishi house of Vijay, who is also a nest protector himself. And all the nest protectors come in at 8 a.m. every morning, every Monday morning, where they share the observations and all the data they've collected over the week and you know, uh, discuss challenges and ways to address challenges and all of that. They also give their, uh, share the data with Tajik, who is the local coordinator and uploads all the data on an online portal. 
so these are like uh, very very fun monday morning meetings so just to share a short story on uh, the role of nest protectors this year like you know in june in the middle of the breeding hornbill season uh, hornbill uh, breeding season we started receiving frantic calls from prem prem is our youngest and an extremely motivated nest protector who joined the hornbill nest adoption program in 2016 he'd gone for a regular uh, nest monitoring visit where he noticed a few men who had come to cut trees so a lot of people there like you know they also use natural resources for their own sustenance and needs but you know he was able to go and convince the men to not cut these trees because they have uh, uh, they occupied by hornbills and the breeding season is on and also like you know the adjoining habitat is also very important for the hornbills so the men left but uh, prem was still not convinced and he's he was scared that they would return to cut the trees once he left so he then went to our uh, local coordinator tajik who went to the person who they suspected had sent the men to cut the trees and uh, when he went there the person admitted that they were in fact his men and he also told uh, tajik about the interaction the men had had with prem and uh, told told tajik that you know he's already told them not to cut any trees in that area so this was a kind of like you know uh, through the local the nest protectors and the local coordinators and you know just through dialogues you are able to do so much uh, in conservation we are happy to share that both the nestries saw successful uh, chick fledging this year as well thanks to the timely intervention of the nest protectors so currently we have 35 hornbill nests we we had more but you know sometimes you lose uh, nestries in natural events like storms and rainfall uh from in the last 10 years the program has seen 173 hornbill chicks successfully uh fledging from these nests and we've had incredible support from uh, various individuals who are uh, hornbill parents and uh, some zoos who also support the program and uh, yeah we've had like uh, very young people support like the program through uh, birthday donations and uh, also a nishi self help group who donated to the program and uh, these are the nest protectors who have been supporting uh, hornbill conservation and like you know been a important part of a decade of protecting hornbills in this landscape if you want to know more about this program there are uh, films that are being made there is one by adarsh raju who is a long term supporter and his video is called pake paga protecting the hornbills of arunachal it's on youtube paga is the nishi word for hornbills uh, we also have a recently released uh, episode on this uh, on the brink season 2 series and it's on hornbills and the uh, conservation efforts in arunachal especially the hornbill nest adoption program where they show the role and like you know work of the nest protectors so yeah if you have time and interest uh, do look at these movies as well uh just to quickly end with uh, apart from a lot of other research and conservation initiatives we also give a lot of uh, focus on nature education programs which is extremely important uh, like you know because we realized that while we were working with different stakeholders it was also important that we start engaging with uh, school children so we work with about uh, seven schools that are just outside the pake tiger reserve and what was surprising was that you know many of the students even though the tiger reserve is literally their own backyard they had never visited or they were they had never entered the tiger reserve and uh, so we partner with the forest department in conducting these three day camps inside the tiger reserve where we take students inside and like you know over uh, three days we have a range of activities that are um, done so we walk the forest and after every few kilometers we stop and you know we do like um, activity session and each activity is uh, focused on students being able to learn important ecological processes and services and most of these are what they are already studying in their um, uh, in their schools but like you know some of these uh, very critical processes are unable to like you know you're unable to understand it unless you are out there in the open seeing it with your own eyes and you know so this is the way that we try and uh, teach them about some of these services some of these processes 
and yeah, they, they, they're extremely happy throughout the three day. Uh, they don't complain about the long hikes. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a real thrill to uh, be a part of these education camps. Also at the end of the day, every day, like, you know, we give them time to either sit by the riverbank or under a tree or anywhere, like, you know, and just reflect upon the day, reflect upon what they saw, reflect upon what they learned. And we ask them to like, you know, either jot down or do whatever that they want to do. And uh, towards the evening, like late evening, we come back together and a lot of them share uh, their reflections with us. Some of them share it in the form of poems. Some of them share it in the form of stories. And yeah, sometimes we have these amazing drawings that come out of these uh, sessions. This particular boy, Sonu, was, you know, throughout the day, he did not interact much with us. But um, uh, in the evening, like, you know, when we had this reflection session, he shared this drawing and he told us that this, act this particular activity that we had on hugging trees for uh, minutes, like some minutes before we start the day, was something that stirred a lot of emotions in him. And this is something that we all feel like all of us also take the opportunity to like, you know, go and hug trees along with the students, like, you know, and uh, every day there is a different set of emotions that, you know, comes up. And uh, it was important that the students were also feeling all of that and were feeling confident enough to share it with us. And uh, this particular hornbill drawing was left to us by this uh, Dalong government school. After they had left, uh, we, after we uh, said our goodbyes, we came back and we saw this huge hornbill drawing on the ground where all the camps were there. And yeah, it was their way of uh, probably saying thank you <laughs> to the forest. So uh, just to end, I know I've discussed a lot of uh, activities uh, ranging from research to conservation to education, but I would like to highlight that, you know, um, anybody who's interested in research should be able to uh, follow proper methods, uh, like, you know, uh, follow certain ethics and also like try and get a good sound baseline information on uh, your uh, species of interest or habitat. This information is critical while you're designing conservation initiatives and also helps you in identifying threats, challenges, and opportunities to work in, <coughs> work in the future. As a researcher, it is also important, not just as a researcher, but even I think when you're visiting these uh, very important biodiverse uh, habitats, it's important that you're also very sensitive towards local communities, their tradition and culture. Many times people from outside go and, <coughs> Sorry, you know, they're uh, very insensitive and they uh, uh, ask a lot of questions regarding the culture and tradition and all. I think it's uh, okay to be curious, but at the same time, you know, not at the expense of making the other uh, member uncomfortable. And also as experts, if you're going in, it's important that you also understand that there is a lot of traditional and local knowledge that already exists within these communities. And it's important that you... Uh, like you know gather the interest of the local communities and tap into these already existing knowledges and you know you then build this beautiful synergy between uh, local stakeholders and uh, research and that's how you can probably sustain your research programs for a longer duration of time and even at, if at all it's you know you would have to leave the landscape you know that you've built a strong foundation for conservation in the landscape uh, it's important that you also work with local communities and not just get them to do your work, but also build their capacities in different ways. Like, you know, uh, you give them trainings on different uh, aspects of your work and engage them in like, you know, not just collecting data, but also trying to like, you know, interpret the study findings and uh, being able to take decisions on ground and being able to make sense of what, what uh, like, you know, why they're doing what they're doing. And all these local capacities have really helped us during the pandemic, where uh, in 2020 and in 2021, we've been able to continue our work in uh, most of the uh, sites that we work in the Eastern Himalayas, thanks to the amazing field team that we have in these sites. And yeah, I mean, we're all, <laughs> most of us are stuck at home during this period. And, you know, uh, our field team would keep sharing these uh, interesting observations and we would be like, oh God, like, you know, why aren't we there? But yeah, it was important that uh, over time, you also train them enough to be able to lead the research. And uh, while hornbill species have been our flagship species for the work in the Eastern Himalayas, 
Over the last two decades, conservation efforts have had multiple impacts on not just the single species, but on the overall like, you know, uh, habitat and other wildlife as well. Thank you for listening. Um, sorry if it was too much of information, but just like to end by saying that uh, if you want to know more about our work, we have these social media handles on Facebook. We are uh, there as Hornville Conservation Program NE India. And we've recently joined uh, Instagram and uh, the handle by the name of Himalaya.ncf. We try and share regular uh, work updates and interesting observations from the field. So if you're interested, uh, do join and follow us as well. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So, ma'am, now we'll be going going forward to the next session, question and answer session. Sure. We'll be taking up the questions from the chat box. So, there's a question from Dhruv. Why hornbills are endangered? Why hornbills are endangered? Yeah, so hornbills uh, receive a lot. I didn't cover that aspect in my talk, but there's a lot of uh, threat that hornbills face. Like, you know, for example, hunting. Uh, in some of these communities, like, they hunt hornbills for meat and uh, for other, like, you know, their, um, it, it's, it's a part of their culture, right? So that was the reason why in the initial years, there was a huge decline in hornbill population because there was not enough awareness and sensitization then. Also the uh, main problem that all the other uh, wildlife species are also facing is habitat loss and fragmentation. Habitat loss is the, one of the major threats to even the hornbills. And, you know, it's also important that we realize that hornbills for the breeding, you know, they require these large trees. And in horn, in forests where uh, these large trees are not present, it, it makes it difficult for the hornbills to breed. Like you, all of you've seen in the videos, like, you know, they require that space. Also, most of their food plants are uh, these large hornbill, uh, like large trees, right? So habitat loss can also um, mean that, you know, there is a decline in food availability for the hornbills. Yeah, so multiple threats, it depends on different sites. It's very site specific. And that's the reason why it's important for you to go and understand and you know, do good research in each site to understand the particular threat uh, for that site. Ma'am, uh, uh, based, based on your research, has the number of species or number of hornbills increased in the recent years? In Arunachal Pradesh, the local people claim that uh, they've seen an increase because, like, you know, they keep telling us that um, earlier the hornbills that uh, they would see had, like, really declined because, like I told you, right, uh, the Nishi community uses the yes, beaks of the hornbills for their traditional headgear, which is also very important for them to uh, preserve their tradition. And because of that, they were hunting hornbills, but later through conservation initiatives that... Uh, like, you know, the natural beak was replaced by a fiber beak. And that decreased the hunting pressure to the great hornbill while still being able to preserve the tradition. And, uh, you know, uh, like, yeah, so uh, people keep saying that uh, there, and these roosts, like I showed you in that uh, picture also, like, you know, the, the roosting that happens every evening, you see this large congregation of hornbills that come uh, to these sites. So people say that they have been seeing an increase. We've not uh, done, I think we've not, we don't have the to compare the team of men now, but uh, definitely in Arunachal Pradesh, the local people claim that there have increased in the yes, Hornbills. It's great to know, ma'am, the numbers yeah, In Baksa Tiger increased. Reserve, it's a fairly new site that we've started working in. The so don't know what the earlier population was like. So the population estimation that we have done now establishes uh, like, you know, a new baseline for this region. And uh, maybe in another few years, like, you know, after 10, 15 years, if we do another population estimation survey, then we would be able to yeah. compare. Ma'am, there is also a question from Symbiosis Kindergarten School. How do these birds seal their cavity? They use their droppings, their own droppings, and uh, it's uh, also observed in some hornbill species. They also use mud, so the male delivers some of these mud, muddy material. And but mostly, it's seen that they use their own droppings. Okay. And there's also a question from Jagdot Singh: How many species of hornbills are there in the world? Sixty-four, I think. Yeah, I think it's sixty-four, and thirty-two in Asia, I think. Yeah. 
and india it's nine right in india we have nine okay. <laughs> i'm not too sure about the number of species but yeah i think yeah i think it's about 64 in the world this is an interesting question man does ncf has any plans to work in lower neora valley areas We've done a preliminary uh, survey in lower, uh, in not just lower Neura, in Neura Valley National Park itself. In 2018, we did uh, a quite uh, some intensive surveys to establish the hornbill population there and to also study the vegetation structure. Uh, is this person also from Kalimpong knows the Neura Valley quite well? I don't know. <laughs> don't know. Yeah, we we have, we've done some uh, uh, in uh, 2018. We did some preliminary surveys, but you know it's very difficult for us to work in multiple um, sites. So for North Bengal, we focused uh, most of our work in Baksa Tiger Reserve after the few uh, initial surveys that we did. And there's a question from Manisha Patel. How many eggs does it lay? So. Uh, it's believed that they can lay to about uh, about two eggs as well, and uh, sometimes we also see uh, both the eggs, like you know, uh, they they successfully hatch, and we see two hornbill chicks uh, that emerge out from the nest. But usually, for the larger-bodied hornbills, like the great hornbill and the uh, wreath hornbill, even if they may be laying two eggs, usually it's just one chick that finally makes it. Probably because of the space crunch and also like you know the amount of food that the male would have to deliver if there are like two chicks and one female inside but uh, we we have uh, had two chicks uh, that successfully fledged in our study in Paki Tiger Reserve and for the lower uh, I mean the smaller size hornbills like the oriental fried hornbills we quite regularly see two chicks emerging and uh, and for uh, grey hornbill and all, there may be more than two also, or uh, two is the highest number yeah, for I'm any species. I'm not too sure of grey hornbill. No, I think I do. I'm not too sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. If anyone has any further questions, you can directly you, type it in the chat box or turn on the camera and ask. Ma'am, I have a question, ma'am. How does yeah. that uh, adoption program works? Hornbill adoption program. So um, we we are quite dependent on individual donations. We ask people to donate to uh, the program. We uh, so there is if you go to the NCF website, we have this uh, place where you can donate, and then you select the hornbill nest adoption program. We also uh, get a lot of support from other zoos. From 2000, uh, yeah, from 2013 onwards, there were zoos that also supported the initiative. But a uh, lot of individuals, they continue to support us and almost like, you know, every year, like uh, there are some donors who have supported us from the time we um, had this program in 2012. So every year they send us some amount to help us, send, you know, the program. Ma'am, you said uh, in this program that the one who is donating, they became like foster parents, on right? Parents, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they get to see the home bills from their um, Yeah, some of our donors have visited our field site. So uh, it depends on the interest of the hornbill parents and probably the time. Uh, the, we have had donors, uh, individual like, you know, donors and uh, interested hornbill parents who've come and visited and seen and actually, uh, like, you know, interacted with the nest protectors who are the local guardians on field and also visit the nest trees. Yes, ma'am. So, it's a yeah, great initiative. Does, but some of them definitely do. And we, we are happy to facilitate these uh, visits. I hope many of us, from uh, those who are attending, will do something. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That, yeah, we would be really grateful to get any support. Yes, ma'am. So yeah, you can uh, you can uh, definitely uh, like you know I I would if you're interested I would uh, really encourage you to see those two films that I mentioned about. Yes, ma'am. And you know because I had to because I had this uh, 45 minute time so I literally ran through the program, but the Hornbill Nest Adoption Program is quite uh, quite an interesting initiative where you know for 10 years it's been like you know a community led conservation initiative and. The community members have themselves taken up upon themselves to protect these hornbill nest trees 
and you know the habitat and also monitor like very very meticulous observations you know they share with saying that the hornbill male visited at this time and it fed this and this we get the the date where the female entered the cavity to the date where the chick exits all because of the help of these like you know the nest protectors so it's a very uh, very unique and very important model of con community conservation so karish ma so movies yeah if you want to know more i don't think i've done justice in such a short time <laughs> yeah that's true that's that's a part of our uh, limitation <laughs> right, right, right. so karish ma yeah yeah definitely uh, the way you have done uh, this long uh, nest protect adoption uh, programs in northeast is there any similar program happen in western ghats also uh, no not in the western ghats this no? was adopted from a program in thailand and uh, we adapted it in the eastern himalayas in western ghats we have a team who have done uh, some very good hornbill research but uh, not uh, with not the nest adoption program okay okay theek hai uh i would like to request everyone to open their videos for a, a group shot uh and then again you can go back to your non video mode but just for a few seconds and meantime uh, you can ask questions also please fill up feedback form which is given in the uh, chat box don't forget to fill up that form yes many are coming out please just for 2 minutes nivedita you can take few shots and even shruti yes ma'am i'll do that uh so any questions you can unmute yourself and you can ask directly Karishma uh, I want yes. to ask one question uh, when you gave us one example of uh, your field worker going to the person and talking and stopping the tree cutting and you said the local uh, you know just a dialogue helped us to uh, avert that particular thing uh, so locals yes after talking and initial discussion uh, it averted but what happens if things are at higher level Uh, like you know, there is there is a uh, increasing pressure of uh, logging in the landscape which is again something that i did not talk about uh, it, i didn't have enough time but uh, of course the area receives a very high pressure of uh, logging that takes place and uh, there are some things that are just not in our control like you know there are higher authorities and powers in place and it's although in the last 10 years we have been able to protect these individual hornbill nest trees the uh, habitat is something that is uh, actually seeing a decline okay and yeah so yeah it's, it's some some things are very particular difficult. study you said it's it's a one of its kind happened for yeah. the first time so we hope for the best that uh, you know taking yeah. those results from your study which has happened for the first time that yeah. the people or government will take some positive actions and listen to the organizations who are doing such a hard work yeah so right. more than us it's also like you know the local uh, nest protectors themselves who have uh, this like you know who have this passion for conservation now and you know it's through their efforts that whatever we've been able to do like protect these uh, individual hornbill nests are also like you know majorly because of their efforts so we hope that you know they are able to convey the message to the larger audience to like you know the entire community and they keep doing these but at the same time um, the habitat degradation continues to happen there uh, and one last thing i realized that when we cut uh, trees we always have uh, another solution that we are planting 50 new trees so it ha happens but in terms of uh, great hornbill or any hornbill species they need a cavity which is that big they need so they even large trunk uh, even if you plant 100 trees for one uh, big tree uh, which you have cut in that place uh, the that Doesn't particular the bird ha huh, that particular bird is going to uh, you know lose their chance yeah. of getting you know chicks uh, out yeah. of that they will not be able to find uh, suitable nesting cavities and you know they may have to miss an entire breeding season and like i said like you know for great hornbill it's usually just one or maximum very rarely two chicks but usually one chick 
so if they miss a breeding season means that you know you miss uh, even like you know adding one more uh, chick to the population so usually it doesn't really help these uh, like you know cutting of trees and then compensating it by cutting uh, by planting some like you know 10 or 15 individual uh, saplings and also like apart from just hornbills right like these uh, big trees old growth trees have such important vital ecological uh, like you know uh, roles to play they are of, like you know they have such intricate uh, relationships with their uh, surrounding biodiversity and that is something that we lose out on when you cut one tree it's just not nesting and fooding like you know the entire uh, balance and the relationship in the ecosystem is like you know completely imbalanced then yes thank you so if anyone have any questions please shoot because we are uh, have, uh, coming to the end of the session so any questions please go ahead um, i would like to interrupt in between uh, i would love to ask to everybody to just fill the feedback form uh, i mean i've posted it uh, if you'll go in the chat box you'll see the link of the feedback form uh, please i request you humbly to fill that thank you yeah so i guess uh, karishma uh, let's end the session thank you very much i uh, request tahir to uh, take take it ahead thank you i would like to extend a very hearty vote of thanks to our esteemed guest karishma pradhan ma'am who spared time from her busy schedule to grace this session today's webinar was full of knowledge and interesting things it gave deep insights into the hornbill conservation in india and also revealed some interesting things the point ma'am where you told us about the breeding biology study video of breeding cycle and hornbill adoption program that was one of my favorite <laughs> and observations were really informative i'm pretty sure that the precious knowledge that you gave us will definitely help us in the future thank you so much ma'am thank I'd you so like, much i'd yeah. also like to thank silpa ma'am for giving opportunity to organize this webinar and inviting Karishma Pradhan ma'am to conduct it. I'd also like to thank all the members of the Biodiversity Cell Committee, Nivedita, Preeti and Darshan, who have really worked hard to make this event successful. Also, thank you to all the participants present here for paying your attention and learning. I'd like to end my speech with a quote like, so don't wait for your friends or neighbors to set an example. Make the first move yourself. They might be waiting for you. So please start converse, conservation right now. Thank you. That's a great message to end with, Ahe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shilpa, for inviting me. Thank you. Thanks to the Biodiversity Cell. Incredible work that you're doing. And I'm sure with all of your um, interest and, you know, uh, the kind of determination that you all have, I'm pretty sure that, you know, it's going to have a positive impact on our biodiversity as well. So continue doing the good work and if there's any other help in any way that we could help you with, uh, please uh, get in touch. We'll be happy to help in any way. Thank you. It was very informative.